Hello, and welcome to A Critical Dragon, where I talk about narrative in film, television, and in books. And today, the the sequel you've all been waiting for, Spoiler <laughs> Talk 2, Return of the Tweed. Um, I am joined today by Dr. Philip Chase. Hello, Philip. Hello, AP. It's wonderful to see you. Um, it, great to have you here. So we ran out of time way out of time for uh, the spoiler talk for Reaper's Gale because the second half of the Malazan Book of the Fallen, while we always could have gone on longer about earlier books, when we get oh, yeah. into the second half, not only are these books huge in, in terms of page length, the, the amount going on in them and that you could pick out and choose to focus on and actually get a lot of depth and understanding and meaning from, uh, just it just seems to grow and grow and grow. And then when you add in the fact that all these things are connected back to previous things, suddenly we find our discussions <laughs> under enormous time pressure. <laughs> That's a fair characterization, I would say, and, and a testament to just how rich these books are. Um, and I, I, I feel like Steven Erickson was really hitting his stride with these later books. You know, there's just, they're beautiful books and there's a lot to say about them. And as we always find out, our, our viewers find additional things to point out. Um, so, and that's a wonderful thing. That's all part of the conversation. Yeah, because actually uh, we'll probably talk about it in this video because uh, one of the commenters, Benjamin, le left a great comment. And I think yes. we should go back and address it because uh, okay. when we when we did the, the first half and we were trying to find a way to uh, carve out manageable chunks for discussion because otherwise these things well yes i i ramble a lot i'm sorry but we we honestly try to have a kind of nebulous structure that we can follow so the video makes sense and when you right. do that you invariably sort of oh, yeah. summarize things you you uh, look for high points because you go right this is what we're going to move through and we left out in that discussion, a, a very important aspect of the story, uh, the mm -hmm. Liberty Consign. And yeah. uh, when I was thinking about it, the Liberty Consign for me, although it is so interwoven into the Patriotists and yes. that particular aspect, the Liberty Consign for me is the sort of the capstone or the touchstone for the connective tissue of all of these other elements. So it has all of these themes that we see everywhere else. And it's the thing that draws them all back into Lether in the city center. So mm -hmm. what I thought we'd do, we're gonna do the, talk about the Malazans, talk about those aspects, because that is a, a an interesting discussion. And I think it's one that everyone's looking forward to. And then mm -hmm. we can finish off with this more overview of the book, because we didn't do an overview of the book in the first video which is what we typically do we typically have the big overview and then we pick yeah. things out but we tried to do it a different way this time because yeah. of my new structure and clearly it failed so <laughs> i wouldn't call it a failure i just uh we need more time that's all so here we so, are the malazans yes do you want to start do you want to start with the extraneous malazans on the the little island or do you want to go straight in uh, boots on the ground. Let's talk about the Malazans in the forest. Like, what, what way do you want to do this? I think we could cover the Malazans on the, um, the the island that's sacred to the Sheikh. It's one of the uh, the three maidens, I think. Right? Hmm. Second, first. I can't remember which maiden it is, <laughs> but it's one of those uh, near in the reach or near the reach. And I think we could cover that pretty quickly okay. um, and then move into the boots on the ground stuff. So, uh, and there's an interesting, you know, a bit of a mystery element to that part of the story as you don't realize right away that uh, you probably do, but it's not explicit right away that these are indeed the Malazans who have arrived on the shore and are basically feeling things out, making, having, establishing a, a, a um, a toehold on this continent where they have arrived for not entirely for, for the, the troops, for the army, for the bone hunters. You know, it's not entirely clear why they're there. I think one reason that seemed obvious to them is uh, retribution for what the Lathari did under the Tais Edur as they were going around looking for champions and they laid waste 
to that one island that was under Malazan um, protection. So that seems to be a, a reason that's sort of afloat, but I don't think everyone's quite convinced that that's the real reason why they're there. Is that fair? Yeah, and remember, like, we then we then get fed the information that the, this giant uh, ice sheet is coming towards them and they, they need wow. somewhere to hide and yeah. they use Sin to protect them and Sin's obviously protecting the island then. Yeah, yeah, uh, that reveal which... is amazing. I mean, Sin's, just the extent of power in this young mage is scary. Uh, it, it's frightening and, and of course her character is developing in some interesting ways as well as a result. And uh, particularly when we, we con uh, contrast that with how we saw Quick Ben dealing with uh, the eater that previous time where it was the illusion of yeah. all of this power that's what quick ben was playing with and here we have sin going no it's yeah. not illusion i'm just this is straight up par suddenly right. we get this idea that but we've always understood that quick ben was incredibly powerful and also very very skilled and he is exceptional we know he's exceptional but he's not the only exceptional one. And there are these other mages that we're now getting to see who are exceptional in their own way. But what is interesting for me about a lot of these mages is that there is a cost to uh -huh. this par. And I yeah. think one of the reasons that Quick Ben is so reticent to fully unveil all of his par is he's aware of what the cost of this is because uh -huh. We do see Sin and uh, her personality is not necessarily stable. Right. And then we have Beak in this story as well, yeah. which again, we see the cost of truly accessing all of that power and acting as a true conduit for it. Right. And when we think then of quick ben and why he is so careful about his use of power i think this is a, a subtle well is it subtle a subtle way of ericsson sort of hammering home that thing yeah there are powerful mages but you can't just whip out the magic uh, and and blow everyone away every single time because there is a cost to it there is a cost to power and that ultimately the cost of power is again one of these themes that runs right through this book and, and runs through a lot of the the series absolutely yeah and, and we'll get to beak later of course but in the case of sin i think the cost is her humanity in some ways uh, that she seems to not <laughs> relate to the other people quite on the same level any longer that she's on a different plane as a result of accessing that much power there is something in her that is no longer grounded in the same way uh, because of the power that has flowed through her and i think you said it just the right way it, they are the mages are conduits it gives you a sense of healthy respect uh for the power but also i think a sense of our our smallness uh, in the face of these vast things so I, I love the way it's done i really do and and if you think that think to the lord of the rings what happens to bilbo what happens to frodo what happened to smeagol the there this allegory or metaphor for the the cost of power uh, of the lure of power and what it takes from you th th this is a trope of fantasy we're, we're big into mm -hmm. talking about tropes at the minute but yeah. this is a trope of fantasy it is something that we explore multiple times and it remains true the that power can be abused power can can do these things that reduce your own humanity when you access it when you, you create it when you're constantly using it it can mm -hmm. separate you from these things does it always no that's that's not what this is talking about. It's right. exploring this aspect of it. And this is, um, in some ways, I think, part of Ericsson's exploration of the cost of power in the same way that the ring was Tolkien's exploration of that particular aspect uh -huh. of it uh, in, in certain ways. Interesting, yeah. And I would say that of the characters, the one that reminds me the most of Gollum would be Rulad. And there is a, there are some interesting parallels, you know, uh, the ring with Gollum and the sword with Rulad and the exercise of power and the gradual insanity uh, that results, the isolation that results, the, the 
damaging devotion to the object to the detriment of all other ties and we see them becoming other something other with with a, a little tiny shard of their former cells buried within but we see them becoming something obsessed something that is that is uh, monstrous in some way uh, and sad because there is an indication of the humanity uh still buried within so yeah i think that that's a really interesting point you made yeah and so uh, this this is when we talk about the the property of fantasy or the power of fantasy to literalize a metaphor I, yeah. I think like this is a perfect example of it. It's not that, oh, power is a ring. And that's it. It's thinking about it going, yes, it, the ring makes sense in the Lord of the Rings. It, it fits with the diegetic reality. It fits with the story world that's been created. It makes sense from that perspective. But it yeah. also works metaphorically or symbolically to look at this thing from taking a, a step back from it to get an overview and to a apply that more generalized or abstract thought to go this is about literalizing a metaphor about exploring a theme about exploring yeah. this and not always saying oh it's just it's a guy covered in coins with a magic sword you know, this right. is about power and it's not just the leader of a country but the manager in a company the um the head of a family the any position of power and authority that's True. what we're seeing that this is kind of being represented here and we're seeing the dangerous aspects of it. So I just wanted to highlight that because it is, I think, a point that's worth bearing in mind that sometimes when we say, oh, yeah, it's about literalizing the metaphor, people go, you keep saying that and, and you never actually explain it. Another form of power we see is that which is wielded by Tavor. And, and, it's, and it's interesting to watch her interactions on this, this island where they're establishing their foothold and how she outwits Sheikh Brillig and uh, the others. And you also have um, Shirk uh, being involved and, and not willingly in what's going on there as well. So there's dynamics going on there, I think. Um, and we begin to get, I think, a bit of respect for Tavor's cleverness as well as she outwits all these people and, and anticipates. Her anticipation is really quite tremendous she is several moves ahead of the other characters and the reader i think still at this point because we don't know what the end game is what tavor's end game is it's but it's not i think about vengeance it's not about uh, it doesn't seem to it's not about conquest because they, they're not a big enough army to hold that territory um so it's it's interesting to watch tavor in her interactions on on this island and the, the planning that's going into it and how she's handling all these chess pieces um very interesting so to watch her and it seems that you know she's a character who's hard to get to know but it, it seems that she is not a character who is easily corrupted by power that uh she is a person of a great deal of integrity as she's making these decisions at least that's how i'm reading her right now so and and i think it's interesting that you bring this up because again one of the things we we constantly emphasize erickson takes these things and he looks at them from different perspectives so here we have yeah the exercise of power but in a very different way, because the sense we get from Tavor is that power is a responsibility. Right. Whereas the sense that we get from Rulad is power is a privilege. And you, you can see that, yes, it's both about wielding power, but the intention yeah. behind the wielding. And let's, let's face it, like, what Tavor does is not necessarily nice. You know, uh -huh. she does manipulate and coerce. She does yep. force people into positions. It's not that she's a paragon of virtue. She is utilizing power and power at its heart. All yep. power at its heart is violence. And this is violence that is being used and shaped. And she, but we always get this sense from Tavor, even mm -hmm. though she is removed, she is always she seems always to be external and very little is given away everyone seems to get that feeling that okay we might not know her but none of them are getting the feeling that she is someone to be feared they all kind of get the feeling she is someone to be respected she's we she seems like she has a plan 
she has a direction where she is going. She seems to know. So why isn't she letting us in on this? What we see, that frustration that we see with Tavor is not because they think, or at least in my interpretation, not because they think she is bad or doesn't know what she's doing. They want to know what it is that she's doing because it seems clear to them that she does have a plan. She's just not telling them. Right. And so all of the, those external perspectives where people don't have a negative view of her, they are either pa um, neutral or grudgingly positive. Mm -hmm. even if they have complaints about her behavior. And I think that's a very fascinating way that Tavor's character gets constructed from these external perspectives without ever once any deep dive into her thoughts, uh, a long character introspection, or any of these long passages of detailing things in, in long detailed exposition. This yeah. is a different way of doing characterization. We also get a view of what power can do to an individual in one other plot element that takes place on that island, which is with the, the Tyst Andy, and particularly with Namander Golet, the offspring of Anamander Rake. And we see what his position of supposed leadership has, has done to him. And it's not pretty in his case. He is not somebody who seems easy with power, he, who seems comfortable with the idea of leading. And as a consequence, I think his character is, is very much a tortured individual in some ways. There's a whole legacy that he's trying to live up to in some respects. And he acts to protect, he does, you know, what he feels as a leader is the right thing when his sister or uh it, it's a little difficult to establish all the family relationships here, but Fade, um, who is one of the more unsavory characters <laughs> in the Malazan world, uh, a character who is uh, most certainly, I'm, I'm sure there are reasons for her issues, but she is somebody who is very much consumed with hate and jealousy. And she's going to kill uh, Sandalath. Uh, and so Namander acts to stop that, but it is not with a sense of, uh, of happiness at all. I mean, he he. What what ends up happening with with Withal ultimately is is a very tragic situation, and it's one of those moments, like back way back when uh, when um, Andrew Mander Rake was trying to spare Whiskey Jack, uh, you know, from the anguish of having to do a terrible thing, uh, a necessary but terrible thing. You have a similar kind of situation here where Withal is doing kind of what he feels needs to be done. And um, Namander is kind of paralyzed in that moment. It's a really awful situation, which ends in, in Fade's death. Um, so that's a really haunting scene, the whole sequence. And I, I know, I'm pretty sure there'll be repercussions as well from all of this, so. Yeah, and the idea of having to kill a relative because they're trying to kill someone else. So. Yeah. On the one hand, you're doing a good thing. You're acting in self-defense of another. On the other hand, you've just sentenced your sister, daughter, daughter, sister, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I broken her wrists. And then yeah. these people have woken up going, why, why are you hurting this person? And right. It's this wonderful moment where we see that subjective view. We, we've always talked about subjective perspectives on things. Can you imagine waking up and seeing a man and a woman struggling and he's broken her wrists? and her, there's a knife on the ground and there's blood everywhere that you'd look at that and your immediate thought is what is that man doing to that woman and right. yet because we'd seen the what had happened up to that point we knew that he was acting to protect other people from fade and of course it will then realizes this they'd match the knife it's actually fade's knife and they put it all together and and then he throws her out a window um Fenestration, which is a word we need to use more often. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it's a great yeah. word to kill someone by throwing them out a window. Throwing out the window. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, useful word, very useful. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, it doesn't come up too much in your life, but yeah. <laughs> You'd be surprised. <laughs> but we, we, we've gone off the point slightly. But it, yeah. that subjective perspectives are, are so fascinating in this. But I, 
This has been a great digression, but I think we need to get back to talking about the molasses because we're meant to be talking about the molasses, Philip. Boots on the ground. Let's do the boots on the ground, man. We we gotta get we gotta leave this island behind and go to the continent now. So, so well, one of the the first things is, um, and I I don't know how well you know the the books of Glenn Cook. Um, I read the original trilogy in the Black Company, the first three books, yeah. Because so much of the Malazan sort of yomping through the, the forests of Lether um, reminds me of the Black Company. Oh, sure. Um, it reminds me of the Vietnam War movies like Platoon yeah. and Full Metal Jacket and yeah. uh, what was it, Born on the Fourth of July and... Yeah. But and also elements of World War II movies like The Longest Day, um, uh -huh. the these classic or Saving Private Ryan, or even later war movies like Black Hawk Down. There are uh -huh. elements of these war movies tied into this because we have the squads are the soldiers split up into little tiny squads. Right. They are deep in enemy territory. They're surrounded on all sides by enemy. They're sneaking through forests and crawling up riverbeds and wading through swamps and you can see where um i get a lot of the sense of the the vietnam war movies like i'm almost imagining more like jungle than like forest yeah but um the reason there's so much of a, a glenn cook resonance in this for me is in one of the glenn cook books the black company sit down in a bar in a tavern mm -hmm. yeah. and they they send out that message saying all of the resistance we're holding a resistance meeting and we're going to plan to overthrow and then they wait there and as the resistance arrives in their ones and their twos for the secret meeting they just club right. them and, and put them because they've been sent there to capture the resistance right so instead of running around the countryside doing it they sit in a bar and let the resistance come to them and right. when i see that scene when i see what hellion is doing exactly. i immediately see that as an homage to Glenn Cook because it you can see the parallels but it is done in such a different way with a different intention and a different feeling the bare oh. bones of it we can see the same structures right. but this is not hellion summoning you know all in and, and having a relaxed time it's you know what let's let's take a position but I wanted to point at that Glenn Cook comparison because I think people who really enjoyed this section Glenn Cook, that military style of fiction, the Vietnam War fiction, the Korean War fiction, uh, that element, I think, plays in quite heavily. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. And uh, the we really focus uh, mostly on three squads, I guess, right? Fiddler's squad and Gessler's squad and Hellion's squad. And through all three of them, you get a sense of the chaos of the uh, and I guess that's what makes a, a <laughs> it's not just luck. So it, it almost feels like Hellion just goes from one lucky thing to another, particularly when she's drunk, which is most of the time. And there is a, a there's an almost comedic element to it, especially with Hellion Squad. But at the same time, you get a sense of the fear and the chaos and the not knowing if the next uh, the next confrontation is going to be the last. Um, so it really does have you um kind of on the edge of your seat as you're going through the Lefairy countryside with these squads they're they're trying to obey the orders they're cut off from command they're they're kind of on their own and you you get a healthy sense of respect for these individuals who are just kind of improvising as they go along and surviving one encounter after another and you, you the losses are are you don't have time to register them exactly but there's a piece of your mind that is like, oh no, so and so just, you know, oh, then that, that, that's the end of that character that you've been with for so many books. And it's tough. But you don't have time to dwell on it, and neither do the characters because it's like boom, 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 you know, and uh, it's breathless in a way. Um, but the way they handle themselves, the way they use their, of course, the munitions are very key in this, and so are the mages who are using Makra in order to hide them from the enemy. So the, the strategy behind it, there's a, there's a, you know, there's an overall strategy behind this invasion, if that's what you want to call it, but these little incursions uh, that are, that are making a statement, you know, and, and drawing out the Lefairy 
um, and, and accomplishing their mission, but at, of course, great risk to the Marines who are, who are doing all this. So it's really quite a breathtaking part of, this, of the uh, of Reaper scale. And one of the one of the uh, thematic elements of this, one of the things I think is is great. So let, let's start with a, a diegetic element of, of how it's tying into the rest of the narrative. Right. Um, because of the Red Mask storyline, a lot of the uh, Lothari military is occupied over there. So that's why the Malazans aren't facing all of the military. And we see that we, we see that ultimately Tavor had a two pronged approach. She needed right. to draw the military out in different ways so that she could get her beach landing elsewhere. So there's a, a big military strategy at play here, even if the individual squads and the individual Marines aren't aware of all of the different moving parts. We suddenly get a sense that Tavor is. So it goes back again to that talking about her strategy. And then we think about the fact on a thematic level, when we think of the futility of war from the all's perspective, and we think of the tragedy of that war, where we have the Lothari as a, as a relatively modern army, backed up by the Eater, who were a tribal society, trying to do modern warfare. And we have the all as a tribal society, who were excellent at the hit and run raids, who were excellent at the, the small groups going to, what are the Malazans doing? The Malazans are actually doing the thing that we thought the all should have been doing. Because for the Malazans, it's not about, oh, this is what modern military tactics are. Malazans are flexible and pragmatic. They look at the situation and go, what tactics will work? Every Malazan squad of these Marines with their mix of heavies and mages and uh, sappers and light infantry, they are a flexible unit that can be deployed in any scenario. And that's where we see the true strength of the Malazans. They are not fixed and formalized into, this is how you must conduct battle. It's right. what can we do to win? Yeah. And we see their dedication. So thematically, we can see those, those uh, elements being reflected backwards and forwards between tribal cultures that uh, have decided, no, we are going to do the formal military thing when they're not practiced at it. And then the right. formal military, the most professional military going, no, but those tactics are the ones that are going to keep us alive. Right. And so we, we see that happening. But even more than that, we see the trust that the commanders place in the yeah. individual units. Yeah, yeah. And when we think about leadership in other aspects of this story, no one else has that decentralized trust in their underlings. Everyone else, it's about tight control. The patriotists, a very tight grip on who is in power and there's a very tight hierarchy. Rulad is separated from any aspect of control and it's all filtered through the chancellor. Yeah. Um, we have the vying for control and power between uh, the deities and their worshippers. We have uh, the Liberty Consign acting in the shadows who they had had their fingers in all of these pies, but their leader is now distracted by something. Mm -hmm. And because they were used to everything being tightly controlled, that everything was managed in this way, none of them had developed the independence of thought. They weren't allowed to act independently. That went against that rigid hierarchical structure that had been formed. So yes. when that leader is missing, that's when the Liberty Consign starts to fall apart and they're, they're acting against each other's interests or they're not acting because they don't know they can. The Patriotists are let off the leash and no one is supervising them. No right. one is keeping an eye on uh, what movements are going where and who's doing what. That Where we see the loss of control, Right. that's where we see it all spilling out. And the Malazans go, but we trust the people under us. And that's why we don't have that same thing, at least I think. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, the Liberty Consign being rendered ineffective, essentially, uh, because their, the tightness of their control was compromised when, when their leader was distracted by, what does this doohickey do? <laughs> but it's interesting because they are in many ways reflective, I think, of the the common belief of, of many of us in, uh, that our politicians are, in fact, in the pockets of corporate entities 
and that these are the, the people in, you know, in the, the dark rooms making the deals, you know, and, and who are really controlling things. But when it comes down to it, they're people too, you know, so it's really interesting uh, also how there's the, there's an irony about the, the Malazan invasion, which initially they thought they were going to be fighting Tais Edor. And as it evolved, it turned out that the Leferi didn't want to be liberated at all. They were kind of, it seemed, counting on the Leferi acting in concert with them. And in fact, they found themselves fighting against Leferi. And ultimately, because of Leferi politics and betrayals and everything else, uh, they, they uh, at the very end, which I don't know if we want to be there yet, but, but uh, just it's, it's interesting how the Tais Edor don't turn out to be the enemy at all. Uh, at the very end, how the Tais Edor are as are betrayed in the end, aren't they? By by uh, Carlos and Victad and and Triba Noel and so forth. So uh, very interesting how that evolves because the Malazans didn't have perfect intelligence, right? They they had to improvise. <laughs> they there was there's, there's a bit of a flaw there in their plan, right? Uh, I, th I think you find there's a very old joke about the the term military intelligence. Yeah, <laughs> the oxymoron. But, um, <laughs> Yeah. But one of the again, one of the things that we see, and it was hinted at in Midnight Tides, and we see it play out here, is yeah. yes, you can you can take over something, but the structures that are inherent in a system, the system that is there, can corrupt things. The Malazans assumed they'd be freeing a people from tyranny, but the right. tyranny is the system. And yes. the the Letheri are just promulgating the system. But yep. um when we we have that that face off with with Hellion uh, in the town, yeah. And how did she gain support in all of the towns that she was in? Because the, she ends up in one, but she's gone through a couple. How did she gain support? Why is her squad so well looked after? Why do they have so much food and all of this sort of stuff? And it's not because they're sitting in a pub. No, but there is a there's a social hierarchy that is intrinsic to the Leferi society. And you have a whole class of indebted, which is uh, you know, a very oppressed group of people that Udnas uh, you know, comes from you know, ultimately. And, and it, it ended it, it with him in slavery uh, to the Tais Eater. But you have this, this terrible inequality in this society. And that is something that Hellion maybe accidentally taps into. Uh, it's hard to tell with her genius if it's deliberate or not, but, uh, but she taps into that we're we're going to get rid of the people who've been oppressing you. Uh, that that and and it proves very effective. So, yeah, her accidental genius is sort of saves the day in a way. So she's the only one who actually attacks the system, the system that is holding them down. Because she right. and who does she kill? She kills the nobles and the money lenders and the yeah. the super rich merchants. Yeah. Now, tell me again why Lucine's plan to cull the nobles in Unta is deemed bad and would never have worked when we see Hellion do exactly the same thing and oh look it works there's a reason why revolutions kill all of the people at the top right. because they're the people at the top of the pile who've been oppressing everyone else that's blood and circuses or bread and circuses yeah Hellion enacts Lucene's coal plan on a micro scale she does it village by village instead of at the top of the empire. Yeah. And for all of the grief and criticism that Lacine gets, yeah. Hellion does this and gets praised. We see how, both, both how terrible, like she just murders people. Let's, let's not forget this. Yeah, but yeah. How, how effective it is. Hell yeah. And so again, going back to one of the earlier books, there was this whole thing that the noble culls were talked about. Why are they doing this? Why is this happening? Oh, right. that is a bad idea. And then in this book, oh yeah, Hellion had a brilliant idea. It's the same idea. Yeah. Um, so I but thought we don't that like was a, the scene. We a, don't like the scene, and Hellion's so likable. So I guess that <laughs> I don't know. But, but it's a I great thought point. it was an interesting point of connection because again, it's about the seeing the same thing but from a different angle. So let's yeah. talk about B. Are we ready for that? Uh, I don't know, AP. Uh, <laughs> this is the scene. This is, well, we don't have to start with the scene because we, we can get there gradually because there is something that makes that scene effective, which yep. is the, the relationship with Captain Faraday's sort 
that is absolutely key to everybody loving Beak. You wouldn't love Beak if it weren't for Farida and Sort, and the fact that we see Beak through her eyes to some degree. And I think that that is because Captain Farida and Sort comes to understand this character, comes to empathize with this character, and um, acts in a motherly way toward this character, that you get a sense of how traumatized and how uh, damaged Beak is from his past. You get that from his, from his own, because he is also a prospective character. Um, and we mentioned before how Beak is uh, an individual who is most certainly on the spectrum, who is, who is aut autistic uh, um, and has had trouble relating to people. And in, just in addition to the traumatized past he has, which is terrible. I mean, the way his, his uh, family seemingly, from the, from the memories we get, uh, it seems like his mother was, his parents were abusive and the mother was incestuous and uh, his brother, the whole story of his brother and, and his relationship with his brother and the guilt, the survivor's guilt that Beak has because of his brother. So all that emerges in this journey that Beak has with Captain Farad and Sort. And by then we were really I think we feel for this character. We want to give him a hug, you know. Um, so it's it's really very effectively done. Yeah, and well, there's one thing I would I would interject here. We can view him as someone on the on the spectrum, but we mm -hmm. also have to bear in mind that in some of his recollections, he talks about how he was so badly beaten he nearly died that he suffered oh. uh, head injuries. It's not necessarily that he's on the spectrum. It could be that he has suffered um, uh, head trauma. And anyone okay. familiar yeah. with someone who has, yeah. has suffered yeah. significant head trauma can know how it can affect their personality. They, they, yeah. One day they are one person, head trauma. The next day they, they have an entirely different personality or they, mm -hmm. they change very rapidly. And uh, that, that it can be very difficult to get used to. So it, I don't want people to think that this is another example of uh, the sort of the rain man uh, just being uh -huh. deployed without any thought. Right. There is a complexity there that we can pick and choose how we're interpreting it. it it's not quite as simple as, um, oh, he's an autistic savant and he's right. the super special person uh, with the, uh, what is the, the description that people use? Uh, super crip, I believe, oh. is they use that as a way of showing how derogatory that portrayal of that stereotype is. Oh, I see. Um, and... I don't, I don't see Beak as that because I see it as a much more sympathetic portrayal of a child from a battered background. So immediately your sympathy is going out to any child from that background. You're not human if you don't immediately feel some sympathy for them. Right. Um, and then from that, we see the honest love of his brother that he has. Yes. His, his childlike recollections of these events, we see the darkness behind it that Beak doesn't quite let himself see right and then we get the trauma of what happens to his brother and how he blames himself yeah no i, I think uh, we've, we've had things in our past where we have taken onto our shoulders things that have happened and it wasn't necessarily our fault but we have felt it is our fault and that point of connection allows us to empathize with this and this is something so much greater this is a true real trauma and someone who is who is not equipped to deal with it and then no one takes the time to help him afterwards so we, we see this we build up this empathy we build up this sympathy and then as this is ex is explored with that relationship with Faradin that you have pointed out yeah. we see how there's an understanding that Beak is not because it starts out, Beak, oh, he's he's kind of odd. Right, right. I mean, and he's he's not a, a popular individual within the Malazan army. I mean, he, he's seen as a bit of an oddity. Um, and he he feels like an outsider, for sure, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and when you're, you're not neurotypical, sometimes social things, you go, it worked the last time I said this. Why is it not working this time? And yeah. you know, someone could explain to you you're in an entirely different social setting. It's a di it's a different paradigm that you should be applying. But you don't right. always pick up on that. And these are things that you have to learn over time. So, 
you can identify with with peak who as it keeps trying he keeps thinking yeah. he's doing the right things to fit in go but that's what they said and he he doesn't understand how that whole thing actually works right and he starts out being viewed as odd and we fear or we deride the things that we don't understand That's and right. then as we grow to understand him we go no this the the point of connection in humanity the things that link us are so much greater than these minute differences yeah. so we build up that sympathy we build up his humanity and we get to understand his very charming almost innocent exploration yes. of what magic is to him yeah with his and, candles yeah and this is the thing that sells big to me as a character while all of that other stuff is true and you build up that emotional connection mm -hmm. magic so far we have seen magic as a destructive weapon we have seen magic do these devastating things we've seen magic as power and with beak we see the beauty of magic these yeah colored candles that light up his world that are soothing to him that mm -hmm. calm him that he feels a perfect affinity for there is a beauty to that that we haven't seen in any of the other descriptions of magic none yeah. of it has reflected this beauty that we suddenly get from big's perspective yeah that's so lovely yeah and, and speaking of beauty so when we finally do get to that scene, that scene, <laughs> and we've built this strong connection to this character with, for whom we, we sympathize or empathize and, and we, we want him to feel like he's part of a family because he didn't get to feel that. He had his brother and he has the guilt over what happened to his brother, the survivor's guilt. So in a sense, we, when the Malazans are about to be overwhelmed by that, just, I mean, the epically described Lefairy majory, this gigantic storm front of magic that's about to descend on them. And it's just absolutely like, it's, it's, uh, gave me goosebumps, you know, reading that the description. It's just brilliantly done. But in Beak's mind, what he's doing is he's saving his family. He's, it's in a way, it's his chance to save his brother, yeah. which he wasn't able to do when he was a, a, an innocent child. And so for him, the sacrifice that he makes, which is so beautiful, is he's, he's having a chance to save his family. Um, and it's, it's a scene that uh, I, I'm choking up a little bit, even talking about it right now. It's, it's a beautiful scene. I think that every Malazan fan can agree. It's, it's one of the um, most emotional scenes in the series. Is that fair to say? Would, would you agree with that, AP? It is certainly such a powerful, such a powerful scene. And yeah. I think one of the one of the issues with very heartfelt, very emotive scenes like this, like we could talk mm -hmm. about, it is emotional. You yeah. can take a very cynical view and go, oh, that's just Erickson trying to manipulate my emotions. You're like, congratulations, <laughs> all authors try to manipulate your emotions. Yeah, if you're going to stand deep outside deep. the text and, and judge it that way, no, it, of course you're not going to follow along with, oh, it was so obvious this was going to happen to Beak. And you're like, well, yeah, the, the imagery of the candle, out, out, brief candle, is an yeah. expression that springs to mind. The brightest candle burns half as long. Beak yeah. even says, before any of this happens, before he's asked to do this, that no, he cannot turn the candles off now. They are going to burn down. He knows he's already. He knows. He knows. He's he knows like he's Beowulf going, going to die. He's like Beowulf going to fight the dragon. He knows. Yeah. Because Beak has already had too much power burn through him. He's already had his magic running active for too long that he will not ever be able to turn it off. It will just burn him up. He will lose control, and so he knows his his end time is coming, and. He chooses to use that moment not to try to kill the Lethari. Right. He doesn't use it in a destructive form. Right. He uses it to protect and, and love his family, the family that he found that took him in, that protected him, that gave him a purpose, that accepted yeah. him. Yeah, they might have made fun of him. Yeah, they weren't. But they never hurt him. Right. They treated yeah. him as a brother. Yeah. 
And that's what he had lost. He had lost his family. He had lost his brother. And he, this time, he was not going to fail. Yeah. Well, I, I grew up that. in the army. I grew up in the army. And I can tell you as an army brat, uh, <laughs> there, is, there are a few organizations in this world where you take a bunch of dis disparate people, you put them together, and they build a sense of camaraderie. And so, you know, I think within the context of the army, they're able to eliminate different kinds of prejudices earlier and more effectively than at the, in the larger society in some ways. So the, the beak is definitely an accepted part of, of the family. Uh, and it's, uh, that also adds, I think, poignancy to the whole thing. It's, uh, it's quite incredible uh, and very well done, I think. And the, the only scene, I think the most comparable scene in the Malazan series to this moment would be at uh, And when he uh, restores the memories of the, of the Tlanamas, when he gives them their, their home once again. And, and as a result of all that power, of that, that the sheer scale of, of, of that weight, he, he, is, he is gone. Right. And then similarly, there is a memorial to Ikovia, and just as there is a, an impromptu memorial built for Beak by the Malazans, who have been all <laughs> bleached. Uh, I, and I think that's an interesting you know, metaphor as well, isn't it? The well, fact cleansed. that they're all bleached. Cleansed, yeah. Um, look, think about it, like they've been crawling through forests, they've been in swamps that, that like everything about them is absolutely dripping in mud and dirt and blood and they, they are all beaten to all hell. And yeah. this moment, this sacrifice, this love that this character feels for them. Yeah. Cleanses away the dirt, cleans them, gives them that new start. Um, yeah his sacrifice. So again, you know, we could talk about it in terms of Christian imagery and Christian mythology. But mm -hmm. I don't think you need a to be that specific to any one religion. I think right. that theme of sacrificing yourself for others for loving others and unwilling to do that. Again, this is, we keep talking about elements of compassion that get explored elements of empathy, we see another element here. Yeah. Um, and this time it is a truly positive one with Ecovian, there was that the cost associated with it, like taking the imas's pain at entirely the wrong moment <laughs> for according the to upcoming, some people for yeah. the upcoming battle and yet yeah. even the people who think he should have waited when press and you say but so how long should we have extended their slavery right go well Right, I understand that point. I do, but right. people I liked ended up dying in that battle. And you go, yeah, that's the cost of it. Yeah. yeah. Um. So even even that argument it, that gets brought up, people recognize that yeah, it Covian did do the right thing. It's just the timing couldn't have been worse. <laughs> um. Yeah. And here we have something where where big sacrifice is the perfect time. And we see that the Letheri even, it, they're planning on uh, betraying the Eater. No, yes. let's face it, history of the Eater, betrayal. They, am I going to feel terrible about it? And in this instance, yes, I would, because yeah. what was about to descend on them, they didn't pick this fight, they didn't pick this war. Right. And they didn't deserve to be wiped out the way that the Letheri were about to wipe them out. And again, we see that pragmatism of, the Malazan Marines and the, the Malazan army standing there and they see the eater running towards them and they don't draw their weapons. Right. They let them in because yeah. they know it, it's no one should have to stay outside that. The Malazans have that ability to analyze a situation and an enemy can become a refugee in a split second because yes. they can read it and they can make that judgment. And so I really like that moment where we see them because the Malazans very easily could have, oh, the Eater are charging. And we could have expected them to fire their crossbows, but they don't. They read the situation and they have compassion for people 30 seconds ago were their enemy. Yeah, yeah. And, and I that, would argue, I, yeah, I, I well said. And I would argue that that compassion is every bit as important as, as what Beak does. You know, that, that's a very important, I think it's Fiddler who sort of 
uh, leads the way in, in allowing get, come on guys, get in here. <laughs> uh, and, and that's really something. It's really something. There are very few. We've seen Esselmont do it as well uh, with the Malazans. Um, so I'm not going to get specific on that so because we're not going to spoil that. But it is something these guys do in their series where you can take people who are who are just about at each other's throats. And then suddenly there is this leap of understanding between them. There is this empathy, which results in an act of compassion and, and understanding. And that is just some of the one of the most beautiful things about this series is how it delivers these moments. And it's it's just something you don't see, you know? You really, this is why the Malazan fans are so devoted to these books. I think this is a big reason why, because it's just not something that's easy to do. Uh, and the way they build up to these situations where you, you have this incredible act of connection and, and compassion is just such a beautiful thing. Very moving. Um, because, and, you know, we've talked now about the, this theme of empathy and this theme of compassion because everyone, oh, Malazan, it's all about compassion. And you, yeah. It's not all. <laughs> That's not the, actually, I shouldn't say, it's not only about compassion. Compassion right. is a, an essential component. But we've yeah. also seen, like, we see this compared to the futility of war in the yeah. all storyline, where right. in the end, all the soldiers covered in mud, no matter what side they are on, they all look the same. They're all covered in this mud. They can't tell friend from foe, and they are still fighting. They're still killing each other. Like, what yeah. more of a, a blatant, metaphor do you have to have about the futility of war than all of these identical people killing each other and you yep. cannot tell the sides apart and here we have a, a, such a pure character having to sacrifice their life to save people from betrayal and what was the betrayal for more money more control because the eater weren't hard taskmasters in fact the eater weren't really masters at all they no. didn't know what they were doing the letheri were running everything the letheri had all of the money it was the letheri who were con in control of everything the eater might have called themselves in control but they didn't control anything yeah it was the letheri and the letheri are going to betray the eater to take back control what control the eater don't have any control they never had any control they were not a they were not in a position to take over the systems that were in place. And yeah. so we have the Letheri basically betraying people for no reason. It's absolutely futile. We yeah. have all of these soldiers who have been killing their way through forests and fighting the Letheri, the very people they were there to liberate. How futile is that? That yeah. the act that saves anything going on is this act of sacrifice. So there's a lot of these different elements woven into this story about control and power and how power is exercised about mm -hmm. system uh, systems of control systems of power and how no one person needs to be in control of them no shadowy cabal has to exist for the system to self-perpetuate and right. that is this spider web that runs through all of Letheri society yeah, and that's that's part of what I think Tehol is trying to bring down, is trying to yeah. to destroy. Yeah, speaking of futility as well, for me, one of the most um, difficult moments in this book, I, I was f sad for Rulad, but what I think the first time I read this gave me such a sense of almost anger um, was the death of Troll at the end. And this is a moment I think that upsets a fair number of Malazan readers because Troll is a beloved character and his death seems so unnecessary in a way at the end where he's, he's stabbed in the back by that loathsome wannabe, you know, uh, uh, police guy, whatever his name is, uh, the, who's, what's his name? I can't remember his name, but you, you know who I'm talking about. The one who wanted so badly to please to be, he had these fantasies of, of being uh, Siren Kanar, Siren oh. Kanar, that's his name, okay. yeah. He, he's the one who stabs Troll. And of course, it's, uh, you can see the anguish of uh, Quick Ben and um, 
who else discovers that? Uh, and and they they Quake Ben gives uh, Sir and Kanar one of the worst uh, punishments ever in in the Malazan world for for what he did for that act of brutality, that unnecessary. So he could prove that he's a man, right? Essentially is why Sir and Kanar killed Troll. He wanted to prove his manhood because he'd been acting like a coward the entire time. So he needed to convince himself that he was a real man. So he stabbed somebody in the back when he was kneeling on the ground and not looking. So, um, but that moment, uh, it, it, there's your futility. I mean, that after he had had the brief uh, union with, uh, with Saren Pettic, and of course, resulting, it's hinted at at the end that there is a child that resulted from that uh, brief union. Um, but but for Troll to go that way, it was so Would you so say brief painful. union or, or joyful union? Well, both, really. <laughs> so, I mean, at least he had that. At least Troll had that. But this is a character death that I, I feel upset about. But I, I feel like it's also very authentic. I'm not mad at Steven Erickson for doing this to me. Uh, I, I feel like there is something very compelling about what he did there. The, the, the fact that often in this world, ugliness kills beauty, that we live in a world where people act out of selfish and, and stupid reasons and, and destructively, and they hurt other people who are often innocent um, and, and beautiful. And so I, I do feel upset about that moment, but I also feel that it does add a kind of um, compelling nature to the end of this book that uh, I'm sad about Troll, but um, I understand, I think, uh, I, I don't think it was a wrong decision. It's just one that makes me upset. You know, I don't know how you felt about it. But, and again, death in the Malazan has, has been something that people discuss endlessly because they feel death has no meaning or it has no value and then it's oh but i was really shocked about that character death and but trolls death so think of what happens to all of the sengar brothers yeah yeah and why why did any of this happen hanan mosag's plan to get the sword to create an empire yep. and they got dragged into it and their family the mother and father are dead all the sons are dead. Right. Two of them killed from betra uh, behind and betrayed. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. We're back to power and what power does, right? And how much of this ties back into their origin myth? Yeah. Yeah. And we see this circle of back. violence. Yeah. The sins of the father repeating on the son through time. Yeah. So we're back to Scavendari Blood Eye stabbing Silcus Ruin in the back. Yeah. And for every death like Beaks that has this beautiful poetic meaning, narrative meaning, emotional meaning and truth, there are going to be deaths that are meaningless, that are futile, because that's what death is. Mm -hmm. Death doesn't... Look at what happened to Lorne. Lorne in Gardens of the Moon didn't have a big climactic battle where she faced off against an enemy and then died dramatically. No, she died in an alleyway in the dirt. Yeah. This, and this is what we talk about when we talk about authenticity to the world and the very similitudinous nature of the world and why yeah. these things can have emotional reson, uh, resonance. It, it's not necessarily that every single time it has to do the, all these things. It's we have these moments that take your breath away and they take your breath away because expectations have been set up one way and Erickson moves us in a different direction. Erickson then sets expectations up in this and moves in a different direction. Tropes are subverted, then tropes play out. You, you're constantly in the sea of not knowing and uncertainty because that's life. Yep. And yet, there are these thematic points and narrative points that join it all together, but not on a superficial level. They run much deeper. So that's when we start thinking, oh, Troll's death, absolutely meaningless. How could this happen? And then you think, well, what about the origin story of the Eater that we've been told again and again? What about what happened to all of his other brothers? When we see people fail and die, oh, 
when they succeed and then die. This book has been about people nearly succeeding, just succeeding yeah. and paying a terrible price. Again and again, we see it in all these different ways. Hmm. Why, looking back on it retrospectively, should Troll's death surprise you then? Right. That is life. <laughs> but I think we've done a bit more justice to Reaper's Gill now. A little more, a little more. But this, I think I am stunned by like the amount of depth. We already had a full hour talking about this. I know. And there's just so much more to it. But I, yeah. I did very briefly want to address uh, Benjamin's comment where he had said that he hadn't enjoyed a particular story thread. And one yeah. of the things that I would say is, that is absolutely fine. No one is ever saying you must enjoy. And he had thought that this story thread in particular was extraneous, was redundant, wasn't needed. And you go, mm -hmm. you can feel that. That is, is absolutely fine. But what yeah. was brilliant about his comment, and one of the reasons why I wanted to highlight this, was he said why he felt it was redundant. Yes, and yeah, so, it was well done. Yeah, Because these themes are handled elsewhere, and it wasn't necessary to have them here. And you know, it was handled over here and it wasn't necessary to have it repeated again. Mm -hmm. And the way that I answered his comment was, it was to point to, okay, we identified the same thing about it, which is, right. yes, these themes are repeated, but where you see it as redundant, I see it as supporting and building the theme up even bigger. And yeah. it's about a different perspective of the same thing. So I would say he is absolutely perfectly entitled not to enjoy that thread and to feel that yeah. It, it's redundant and it shouldn't be there. And that's the joy of reading and the joy of talking about these books. We can have very personal reactions, but he and I identified exactly the same narrative function of that thread. We yes. just viewed it in different ways. Yeah. Well, and that's the beauty of literature too. Everybody brings their own experience to it and their own interpretation. So, but I have certainly enjoyed hearing yours today, my friend. <laughs> Uh, it, it's been uh, uh, beautiful and enlightening. So I thank you for uh, having me on your channel once again. And thank you so much for joining me, Philip. Like discussions, uh, jokes aside, we love doing this. We, we do this as a hobby because we enjoy talking about these things and exploring these things. And thank you once again for joining me. And I will say to our viewers, thank you very much for watching and we'll see you in the next one.